heard a lot about you, and I'm very impressed, and I'm very excited to get to talk to you tonight. Thank you. I've heard a lot about you because my mom has like all this, um, all the like the biogra- biographies and stuff. Uh huh. Well, you know, two things. When I, when someone young talks to me about the Letterman, I ask them two questions. I ask them, how do you know about the Letterman? Either your mother or grandmother brainwashed you, or <laughs> you've spent a lot of time in elevators. They they refer to the Letterman music. Some some young people. When I was young, all the older artists we referred to as elevator music, and you probably don't understand that because. They don't have mm-hmm. elevator music like they used to, but mm-hmm. all the pop stations back in the 50s and 60s were, were kid, you know, to the kids. But they had these, all these old, old recordings of some of the older Castellanets and, uh-huh. and uh, you know, all these uh, old bands. They'd have them on tape, and they'd play them in elevators. Wow, that's cool. <laughs> so we, the Letterman are, for, for young people back in the early, late 50s, and we're for college kids, and we're for older people, and uh, so we try to make our music uh, uh, applicable and uh, accessible to every age group. Okay, how did you get the Letterman for your group? How did the name? You mean the name for my group? Yes. Well, that was my first mistake. I uh, there's a story that I tell people that when well, let's say okay, what would you do, Pavlina, if you started a vocal a band with your friends? What would you call yourself? What, what would you What would you call your if you if you, are you a guitar player? I play the steel drums. Oh, okay. Now, if you wanted to start a commercial group, what would be the name? You'd make a list of names, right? That you and your friends would say. What should we call ourselves? And you'd look around and you'd look at other groups that are out there, and you'd start saying, "Well, this is a cool name." No, that's not a cool name. What could be a real cool name? So you'd be affected by the groups and the people around you. So when I started the Letterman back in 1958, Mm -hmm. I was looking around at all of the other groups, what they were calling themselves, and how we could have the coolest name of all the other groups that are around. And back in the late 40s, it turns out that all those groups, they looked around, and the groups around them were naming themselves after birds. Really? There was the, the Swallows, there was the Mellow Larks, there was the Orioles, there were the Penguins, there were the, you know, all these bird groups, the Sparrows. So that's all they knew at the time. So when that, in the late, in the later on, after, after the war, in the 50s, people started looking around what they called themselves, and, and it was cool to call yourselves names after cars. In okay. those days, in the middle 50s, there were the Cadillacs, the Impalas, the Etzels, the Fleetwoods. So that's how kids were influenced by the names they would call themselves. Well, here I am in the late uh. 50s now looking around at what to call my group. And I looked around, and there were groups called Danny and the Juniors, mm-hmm. a school name. There were the Four Preps, a school name. There was the uh, Four Grads. There was the Four the uh, four Freshmen. And mm-hmm. no one had used the name The Letterman yet. And yes. I thought, wow, this is going to be so cool. We'll call ourselves The Letterman, and we'll use these letter sweaters and we'll wear these letter sweaters, and that'll be one more way that people will know the Letterman because we'll have the visual aid, yes. and they'll remember us rather than the 10,000 other groups. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's cool. Um, and you've had a lot, of se- um, a lot of songs since the 1950s. When you started those songs, um, and everyone still knows all the words, and they're so really popular, how did you feel about the success over 50 years? Well... Pavlina, I feel very, very blessed. It's nothing that I did. It's mm-hmm. something that God let happen. Uh, we were at the right place at the right time. It was the late 50s when people were getting more sophisticated. Um, uh, televisions were in, and, and a lot of kids were in the, in the late 50s, early 60s. There was the Beatle invasion, and there was some drug culture starting. And the Lettermen were very, very, very square. I've never done a drug in my life. When we looked around and we started singing these songs, they were just simple. We never got involved in, in negative messages of songs. A lot of groups around us, Blowing in the Wind, Peter, Paul, and Mary, and Bob Dylan, and a lot of these other acts, were, they're getting involved politically with their music. And my theory was, you know, I'm just a singer. I don't know anything about politics. They leave, leave the politics to the politicians. I don't know anything about drugs. Leave leave that stuff to the druggies. So all we chose to do songs about love. Mm -hmm. Love, 
harmony, kissing, and sweetness, and light. And, I, you know, Pavlina, I think no matter what happens in our society, mm-hmm. I don't think love, pure love, will ever go out of style. No. So I think we've been fortunate. When we're singing about love, it transcends generations. You know, there was disco, there's punk rock, there's folk rock, there's, there's uh, emo rock, there's disco, there's all kinds of styles come and go. But really, the bottom line is we, the Letterman sing about love, and I think that's been our salvation for 50 years because we sing simply about positive love. Mm-hmm. When you started um, singing and performing, you started at a really young age, um, and now a lot of kids are starting um, at a really young age performing. And um, is that a good difference or a bad difference, do you think? Well, I'll tell you what, that's a very good question. I don't know anybody else's life but my own, and I can only A my life. I can't go back and, and do another B scenario. Uh, I feel very fortunate. I was mm-hmm. from, I'm number eight of 11 children. My mother and dad had 11 of us, and we lived in a five-room house, we only had two bedrooms. Up until the time I was 10 years old, I slept in the same bed as my three brothers and I till I was 10. So what I'm trying to get to is that I had a lot of support. My brothers loved me, and our family was close, and it was. I started singing just on, by accident at a dancing school recital when I was six years old. And I was singing on stage, and it was a local high school at a dancing recital showing the mommy and daddies how their monies go toward their kids' lessons. And either I was so good, uh, they had me do the song three times. I stopped the show. I was either so good or I had so many relatives in the audience. Yes. <laughs> they, they were the ones that applauded the most. So I think, I think the answer to your question is that I think it's better to start young, mm-hmm. but only if you have the right foundation. You can't have a a stage mother that wants to live her life vicariously through her daughter and pushing her on stage and Mm -hmm. and getting the adulation for her daughter and forcing her daughter to do something she doesn't want to do. With me, my family didn't force me to be a singer at six and seven years old. That's what I wanted to do, and I wanted to bring honor to my family, and I wasn't doing it to be a star. I was doing it because I liked to do it. And I think if it doesn't matter what age you start, and, but you have to have the right idea of what it's going to be. It's not mo- Moonlight and Roses. If people see Mon- Hannah Montana and they see the TV show and it looks so easy and she gets on stage and she does these songs, it, it, to the general little kid out there, they say, well, I can do that. That's very easy. I want to be a star like Hannah Montana. But what I say to people is you're only seeing the easy work after the hard work has been done. If you want to be a singer an entertainer, it is very, very, very difficult. Sometimes you have to give up the Little League baseball team, the Pop Warner football teams. You have to give up the Girl Scouts and the, and the Boy Scouts. And, and you have to really concentrate on what it is to craft, to, to help your craft, to hone your craft. Mm-hmm. Because you know, the road is tough when you're out there doing shows. We tell people that we sing for nothing. The only reason they pay us the salary they do is because of the travel to get there. Mm -hmm. Because once the setup, the sound checks, the lights, the sound, our musicians, our road manager, our sound men, all of this is very, very, very difficult. Show business has two words, show and business. Mm -hmm. And if kids out there listen to your show, they got to realize there's no easy road here. You've got to be willing to work twice as hard as that mathematician, that scientist, or that that actor in the next uh, seat in your school. or mm-hmm. So it's as difficult as anything else. So if people go into this business thinking it's easy, they might as well just step out of it because it's very hard, but it's very rewarding. Mm-hmm. When you work as hard as you'd work to, to be successful over all these years, different for every person. But so I say the differences are this. If you have a realistic approach to what it is going to entail, then it's good. But if you go into it false impressions like, oh, this is going to be easy, Mm-hmm. then that's a bad difference. 